our expert today, Neil Harrington, has been involved with the Marine Science Center for many years, and he is also a resident of Fort Townsend. He has worked as an environmental biologist for the Jamestown Sculum Tribes Natural Resources Department for 10 years, and his work focuses on harmful algal blooms, native Olympia oyster habitat restoration, invasive green crabs, dungeness crab, larval monitoring, outreach, and education. He represents the tribe on the Dungeness River Audubon Center Board, the Jefferson County Marine Resources Committee, and the National Harmful Algal Bloom Committee. Previous to working for the Jamestown Sculum Tribe, he was a shellfish biologist for the Port Gamble Sculum Tribe, the Jefferson County Water Quality Manager, and an organic farmer. He earned his bachelor's degree in biology and a master of science degree in bio biological oceanography from University of California, Santa Cruz. And if you used to attend this lecture before COVID, he was our last speaker before we went to <laughs> online. So we're so glad to have him back and talking about this new topic. So here is Neil. Yeah, that was 15 years ago that I was up here, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here again um, and see a lot of familiar faces I haven't seen in a few years. Um, yeah, the Marine Science Center really holds a special place in my heart. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I met my wife um, at, when she was in AmeriCorps. We were out staining fish with um, Ann Murphy um, doing a nearshore salmon study. I worked for North Olympic Salmon Coalition, and that was way back in 2001. Um, yeah, since that time we got hitched and had a couple of kids and um, built a house and uh, my dear aunt and uncle Eric uh, and Jean Harrington moved here um, and Eric was the, the board president, um, just passed on sadly. Um, uh, and yeah, and my daughter did like all the camps and I think so did my son and she just started college at Whatcom Community College in Bellingham. So yeah, things go on and on. Um, I'm talking about you, honey. My wife, Renee just walked in the back. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's hear. And I, uh, yeah, as B mentioned, I have a great honor of, of being a biologist for the Jamestown Sculm Tribe. I, uh, I've worked for them for 10 years and um, it's just uh, a really great, um, yeah, it's great to be part um, and help um, the tribe um, with uh, protect and enhance their treaty resources in this area. Um, one of, before I start, go any further today, so I'm gonna do an update on European green crab, but I wanna uh, have some acknowledgements first. So, oh, that is not the laser pointer. This is the laser pointer. Um, I wanna thank Lawrence Stolman at US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and Dungeness Spit. Um, he, uh, he, gave me the slides that you'll see pertaining to Dungeness um, National Wildlife Refuge. And he and I have just worked a lot and they've done a really amazing job as I'm gonna talk about um, in trying to eradicate green crab out there on graveyards fit um, on the refuge. Um, Carl Moeller, uh, Lummi uh, Tribe Natural Resources. He uh, gave me the data you'll see for the, um, on one of the maps, the statewide maps for the Lummi um, Sea Pond green crab data. Um, Chandra Johnson uh, produced most of the maps you're going to see. She's our GIS analyst at Jamestown. Um, and Chelsea Buffington at Fish and Wildlife mm. is now kind of head up. Do we want to cut the lights? Oh, she's waiting. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, is that better? Yeah. Folks, it's not too dark in here. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Chelsea Buffington has just been amazing. She's a real go-getter, willing to get uh, very muddy, but now she really leads a lot of the on-the-ground effort along with Alan Pluse, who runs the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then um, Emily Grayson at Washington Sea Grant. Some of you probably know her and uh, P. Sean McDonald, they could have put his name on here as well. Just been really good partners. So I wanna emphasize that there's a lot of partners that work on this problem together. And I think um, sometimes people think about like governments not working very well together. And this is one of those places where, where we all try to do our best. So. Um, Quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So what are European green crab? We better know what we're talking about. Um, why are they a big deal? Are they a big deal? Um, and yes, they are. Um, uh, how did they get here? 
um, the sort of statewide status, and then I'm going to go into sort of a local response and focusing on three areas, Squim Bay, Dungeon, uh, Dungeness Bay, and Discovery Bay. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the future, like what, what do we think as we go forward here? Um, you know, the theme of this is the future of the oceans. Um, so many of you are here because you're interested in green crab because you've been seeing some headlines. Um, in the last year, uh, there have been a smattering of them here. Um, so they've been found in Alaska for the first time. Um, Jay Inslee declared uh, a European green crab emergency uh, after a large number of them were caught in the Lummi Sea Pond up near Bellingham. Um, and so that has freed up quite a bit of funding and really increased the sort of statewide organization and response. Um, here's just something from Fox 13 uh, from the other day. So about a quarter million green crab were caught in the state this year, mostly out on the coast. Um, here's a picture of our Congressman, Derek Kilmer, um, out at Seabeck along with um, Emily Grayson, who I just mentioned. And um, they are uh, trapping green crab. Um, so he's, he's um, trying to help with that as well in terms of funding from the federal level. Um, he's a very involved congressman. I've, I've run into him since very, like he's, he really cares as far as I can tell. Um, I really like Derek. Um, uh, let's see here. And then um, just looking further afield, you know, there's some issues, you know, thinking about Maine and going, oh, okay, they've been here for a while. Now, what are they really doing in terms of ecological effects? So. Um, Let's see here. So what are European green crabs? Big thing I'm probably going to say more than once is they have five marginal teeth on their carapace. They also have three rostral bumps, which aren't super noticeable here that don't extend past the eyes. Um, they are a cankered crab, Parsinus myanus. Um, they are native to Europe, as we well know. Um, however, they are not always green, so only half their name is really uh, suited to them. Um, you know, down here are a couple we've caught that are that are reddish and, and yellow. I mean, usually there's somewhat of a green uh, tint, especially if they've been relatively freshly molted. The redder ones often are ones that have not molted in a while. Um, they're a generalized omnivore, so wherever they end up, they get to eat. And so they're a very good invasive species in terms of, um, they're well suited to be an invasive species, I say, they're not a good invasive species. Um, so they're a well suited invasive species. So wherever they end up in the marine environment, especially upper marine environment, they can find something to eat. And so um, they're relatively aggressive. Uh, so um, I've heard of studies where they put lobsters with their dens and then a European green crab would eject them from their den because they're more aggressive than a lobster. And the green crab was like one fifth the size of the lobster. Um, and part of the reason why invasive species, I, I didn't put it on the slide here, but part of the reason why they are often successful outside their native ranges is because they have often outrun their parasites. So in Europe, for example, part of the reason why green crabs don't go totally crazy in Europe is because they have parasites that keep their population in check to some extent. So while we have predators here of green crab, other green, larger crab, of larger cankered crabs, bird, you know, seagulls have been found eating green crab, otters eat green crab, they don't have their parasites that keep their populations in check in their native range. So um, that's part of the reason why. Uh, one other thing I should mention is unlike some of our native cankered crabs like uh, Dungeness crab and, and red rock crab, they have a pretty, uh, they're fairly freshwater tolerant. So you'll sometimes find them around creek mounts and um, they may be actually sort of sheltering there away from some of our larger crabs. Like red rock crabs will happily eat a green crab. So, um, so they have like a really large tolerance for temperature, for, for salinity, and, um, and then they kind of eat just about anything. So um, well suited to be an invasive species. So possible impacts, uh, the upper, um, the upper uh, photo on the right is I believe Casco Bay, Maine. This was the site of a 400 acre eelgrass bed. And then, um, so that was the eelgrass bed on the left. And then um, this is one of those, this is a screenshot of one of those pictures that you can toggle back and forth of the same place before and after green crab. And then, 
and this is the mud flat that remains after green crab proliferated in that bay um, after a, an invasion in the early 2000s. So, um, so eelgrass obviously is really important habitat. In the Northwest, we do have some of those other crabs such as red rock that will live in eelgrass beds. So we don't know if we're gonna see eelgrass loss. We do know that their foraging behavior based on some studies that were done up in Canada in the absence of predators definitely will, will pull up eelgrass. So that as they're foraging, they actually like physically disturb it and, and, and it kills off the eelgrass. Um, they predate on clams and oysters. So um, when they invaded Maine, the soft shell clam industry collapsed. Um, so um, a lot of oyster growers and clam growers in the Northwest protect their crop with uh, either bags or with netting but um, still it's an issue in terms of, of these crab being able to eat, eat young shellfish. Um, perhaps one of the bigger issues in my mind are things like salt marsh erosion. So this is our, our, um, our native hairy shore crab, very endearing. Don't, the, the sad face is when it encounters a green crab because they're a lot bigger than them. Um, but if you think about our native shore crab, hairy shore crab, and uh, Hemigrapsis organensis and Hemigrapsis nudis, the purple shore crab, they don't get very big. So they are maybe an inch or two too wide. And so if you think about those banks in a salt marsh, those burrows are not particularly large. But if you think about a green crab being three to four inches wide, and you think of the same density of those crab, you're going to end up with a lot more salt marsh erosion. In addition, they're going to compete with native crabs. So they found um, in uh, Catherine Rivera, De Rivera and Ed, Ed Groschultz, um, and uh, Gregory Ruiz found that um, in Bodega Bay, um, Hemigraphsis organensis populations went down after you had a green crab invasion. So, um, so yeah, so especially these small crabs could really take it in the nose if green crabs proliferate in these salt marsh habitats. Um, so that, that's, that's when people are like, what are, what are green crab really going to do? I worry about the salt marshes the most and I kind of eelgrass second. Um, I don't really want to find out is the answer. Um, so how did they get here? Um, the U.S. East Coast in the 1800s, probably ballast water or something else like that. There was another invasion of the East Coast of a more cold hardy uh, phenotype or uh, uh, that uh, late in the 19th century. So that we get ended up with another invasion in Maine and New Brunswick. Um, they were first noticed in San Francisco Bay in 1989. And we think that might've been a bait transfer because uh, they actually ship worms from like Maine to um, San Francisco. And, uh, but we don't really know. Uh, we do know that they found them in a lagoon in Redwood City and said, well, maybe we should try to get rid of these. And then nothing happened, I guess. And then they were kind of everywhere. Um, so uh, European green crab, like all crab, produce planktonic larvae that then um, drift for weeks or months um, with the tide. So several uh, zoeal stages and then a megalopal stage. And, and then they finally settle out. So green crab can be planktonic up for 80 days. And so during El Nino events, um, currents took green crab from San Francisco here in Central California, north to the outer estuaries of Coos Bay, Willapa Bay, Grace Harbor, the outer side of Vancouver Island. Um, and so um, they were established out in those outer coastal estuaries within 10 years. Um, however, there was a large effort to look for green crab in the early 2000s in Puget Sound in the Salish Sea, and we didn't find them. And part of that is due to um, estuary and circulation. The general surface transport in the strait is outward. Um, and so there's not actually a lot of, of um, I think my oceanographer's hat, there's not actually a lot of input of oceanic water there is, but it's mostly in deeper below where the larva might be. So, um, however, in 2012, they were found in Sook Basin near Victoria, British Columbia. And then this last year, I was actually should have added another uh, arrow onto the here. They were found in Southeast Alaska. Um, so probably just right up at the top of this map. So 
um, they continue to spread. So, so where are we at in Washington state in 2022? Um, just to orientate you, I did mention Souk Basin, that's right up here in 2012. Um, these are the, um, the captures for the year. And um, Lummi uh, Sea Pond, which is an impoundment that was built in the 70s for uh, raising um, salmon and shellfish, um, it's like 700 acres impoundment, seems to be a great place to, uh, like it's an aquaculture pond, which also seems to, to grow green crab really effectively because um, they produce larva and then they probably just, they just drift around the pond and then they settle out right where they were, they were born. So um, one of my big concerns, if you think about this is Puget Sound, once you start thinking about larval transport, once they're established within Puget Sound, their larvae are gonna drift around and then settle right back out kind of near where they were from. Whereas if you think about these coastal estuaries, even though they've got large populations, a lot of those crab larvae are just gonna, are gonna end up in the open ocean and settling out maybe even on the outer coast where they're not gonna get particularly well established. Um, Macaw Bay has a population of about 20, they caught about 25,000 crab out there. So right near Hobuck, if folks have been out there. Um, and two new places that I'm gonna talk a little bit about Seabeck. So the um, Washington Sea Grant has a voluntary monitoring program that I'm gonna talk about but they caught uh, about 14 crab in Seabeck this year. So that's concerning because it's down here in Hood Canal. Um, and if you think about larvae being produced here, they're probably gonna stay in Hood Canal and that's concerning. Um, and then we found them in Discovery Bay. So that's Fish and Wildlife. And, and I was out there with them that day. Um, and I'm gonna talk more in depth about this. This is Squim Bay, Dungeness Bay. So still low populations there um, this year. Um, uh, so I'm gonna refer to trapping. Um, repeatedly in my talk today. I wanted to talk a little bit about that metric. So we set two primary types of traps, these box shaped fukui traps, and then these barrel shaped um, minnow traps or fish traps. Um, these are better uh, collecting smaller ones or young of the year. And these are better for collecting larger ones. Um, so say I have two traps, I set them for one night, check them the next day, that's two trap sets. But say I rebate those and then check them the next day, that would be four trap sets. So even though it's the same trap, it means that's the number of times I checked or, or whoever checked traps. So when I talk about trap sets or traps, I don't mean actual individual traps, I mean times the traps were checked. Set and then check. Um, generally overnight. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about local efforts a little bit. Um, so there's sort of three organizations locally that do a lot of trapping. Um, in addition, well, four really, um, when you talk about uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service up here at Dungeness Spit. So the round stars are, are older detections of green crab before 2022. So Cala Point, Wendy, I was talking to you. Um, you guys caught a green crab at Cala Point and there was follow-up trapping with Washington Sea Grant and Fish and Wildlife and we didn't find any more crab there. And there continues to be monitoring there. Um, these uh, these orange pins are where there's Washington Sea Grant uh, monthly monitoring between March and September. So they set out six traps, take really good background data on uh, the salt marsh, and um, and that has found several new detections of uh, green crab, um, including down here in Seabeck. So that's just off the map here. Um, and they did follow-up trapping, caught more. So they've caught about 14 green crab around Seabeck, which is very concerning. Um, and then these purple and blue dots are fish and wildlife in Jamestown doing, we call it prospect trapping. It's really looking at the fact that there's a lot of habitat out there and you can only have so many sort of monthly monitoring sites. Um, and so that's going out to sites that maybe are unfeasible for a monthly monitoring site or just looking at other salt marsh channels that might occur there. Um, and so um, with the governor's proclamation, there is actually a fair bit more funding for more technicians to do this, these kind of work. Um, so, and the big uh, news this year was a detection at Discovery Bay. Unfortunately, there is a Washington Sea Grant site out there, but it was in a lagoon that just didn't, I mean, it didn't have green crab in it, but like the adjacent lagoon and an adjacent, um, relatively adjacent um, 
channel had 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 a quite a number of green crab. Um, so yeah, so these are the really the the three the three big Sea Grant and Fish and Wildlife have been really amazing. Northwest Straits Foundation up in Drayton Harbor has also been a really important partner. Um, so this is South Discovery Bay 2022. Um, in July, uh, two technicians came over, three technicians from Fish and Wildlife came over and we trapped. Um, so the yellow dots, the yellow and blue dots are trap locations. Doesn't say actually, a lot of these were trapped repeatedly, but um, just to give you a sense of the, the aerial coverage of these. This is Snow Creek, really fresh. So we actually didn't set any traps or very many traps in Snow Creek. This is Salmon Creek, Highway 101, Highway 20. This is Fairmont Road. And um, this is a marsh that we've trapped repeatedly over the last several years with fish and wildlife. Um, and three small young of the year crab were caught here first in, in late, or actually, I think it was actually early August. And then we expanded trapping to here. We caught a couple more along Snow Creek. And then uh, Fish and Wildlife came back and we did trapping here in, in Salmon Creek. We realized there was a lot of habitat. You get out the aerial map and you start tromping around and um, you realize there's a lot of salt marsh channels out there. A lot of suitable, suitable habitat. Um, we also threw a couple of traps in here. And this is where the monthly monitoring site is for Washington Sea Grant. Um, and we set some traps in there, didn't find any, and nor did the Sea Grant folks find any. However, in this channel, or excuse me, this lagoon here, Long's Lagoon, um, we caught quite a number, and then we caught a lot right here at the mouth of Salmon Creek. Really localized, which is really interesting to think about all these traps. You know, one crab here, no crab here, no crab here, huge concentration right here. So if you think about these, these larvae as they're settling out, there's a thought that larvae tend to kind of school, maybe, maybe it's schooling behavior, but they tend to sometimes stick together and they'll often settle out together. So when, um, when I, I ended up doing trapping, fish and wildlife wasn't able to come back out and I, and I went out with some shrimp traps, um, collapsible shrimp traps and did a lot of trapping at the mouth of Salmon Creek and Snow Creek. And I was just kind of amazed because especially Salmon Creek, it was like a bank about the size, you know, width of this room was where we were getting almost all the crab. And like 50 feet that direction, we didn't get any, even though we kept setting traps, 50 feet that way, we weren't getting any. Up a channel, yes, maybe one, and then not, and you're like, what? Like, why can I keep throwing traps in this one pool for two weeks and keep pulling out green crab? They just, and it's all good habitat. It all looks really similar, really nice high bank habitat with, with a lot of, um, with a lot of uh, burrows in it. Um, so, um, so really these were our two kind of concentration sites, but next year, uh, Fish and Wildlife and Jamestown will be back out here again and checking some of these spots. Some of this one in particular was really hard to get to um, as was this one. Um, so, but again, we actually set a fair number of traps here and only caught like one crab and even follow-up trapping didn't show much. So um, unlike here where you, you know, the first day we checked this area, we caught like eight crab and you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is serious. Um, so um, what's interesting is that in this lagoon, there were some pretty big old crusty adults, like 88 millimeters. This had been trapped in 2018 and nothing was found. Um, so we're kind of worried this is a, a nascent population that had started breeding. We did find young of the year. So like more like 20 millimeters, so two, you know, less than an inch, um, or about an inch, inch long. So, um, so yeah, um, I think, um, I'm going to move on to Squim Bay now. Um, so this is, uh, kind of a roundup from 2019, but, but we started trapping here in 2017 after Dungeness spit, uh, green crabs were found there. And um, the tribe was like, where else are we gonna trap? And it was like, well, here's our office right there. Um, we have all these marshes right around us. We should be trapping here and here. Um, and so over those several years, 2017 through 2019, we caught three green crab. Two, one in 2017, that was a smaller female. And then two larger males in 2019 that were probably all from the same larval cohort. Um, so 2020 
we caught no green crab, which is just about the best thing that happened in 2020. Um, a lot of other stuff that happened in 2020, which is not so great, but no green crab. But what was happening in 2020 was that probably green crab larvae were settling much more than they had before um, and waiting for us in uh, Jimmy Kim Lately estuary. Oh, whoops, um, here. And so over the course of a lot of trapping in South Swim Bay, so again, the tribal center, if folks have seen it, is right here. This is Highway 101. Here's the casino parking lot. And here's the restoration area, actually. Jimmy Kim Lately Creek um, and Dean Creek were the sites of a massive uh, estuary restoration that the tribe and other partners did in, uh, I think, 2003. So um, they removed a huge amount of fill. And so this is a little creek called Dean Creek, where we caught a couple of crab. This is Jimmy Kim Lately Creek, which used to be ditched and would just sort of like run straight out, subject to a lot of flooding. Um, and it's now a really good summer chum stream. Um, so uh, we caught uh, over the course of 2021, 16 green crab. And um, that was in a, a total of 758 trap sets. Um, and this is Chicken Coop Creek here as well. Um, so a variety of different spots around Swim Bay. Um, there's some debate whether or not crabs were going from here to there. If they're in a happy spot, like a big bank with a lot of uh, crab burrows, they probably don't go very far. Um, we think that they've got pretty, or we know they have pretty high site fidelity um, in studies where they've done um, tag and release. However, some of the adults probably do move uh, quite a bit so that, you know, you could get an adult that would move from, from Jimmy Come Lately here, or maybe move from one salt marsh channel to another. Um, and this is much more of a mud flat habitat. Um, it's very interesting that we, we were finding as many as we did there. So their catch per unit effort was 2.1 crabs per 100 trap sets. Um, and in 2022, and we really felt like we've got to get these guys out of here. You know, the first two I caught was a male and a female one day after the other. And I was like, well, I got a breeding pair out of the population. Um, and there's some indication maybe that that worked. Um, we didn't catch any young of the year in Squim Bay this year, we caught two large, um, a female and a male in, uh, in Chicken Coop Creek that were pretty crusty. Green crab, uh, I don't know actually how common this is in, with crab, but they end up with a terminal molt. They only molt so many times in their life. And then they kind of get big and you'll find them like covered in barnacles and then they just don't molt again. And then they, they die um, at some point. Um, so these guys were, were big and had probably terminal, you know, they were on their terminal molt, but they were probably the same cohort from 2020. So we hope that we don't find a whole bunch of green crab next year that were, you know, from this year that we didn't see any young of the year. We set traps for them, but um, yeah. So this is a cautionary yet positive tale to my, my, um, my thinking is that if you get a nascent population, something that really hasn't established and you trap it hard in the habitat that's available, you may actually be able to reduce their numbers enough so that they're not generating a lot of larva. If you think about Squim Bay, it is, um, it's things in the way, but, but it's pretty enclosed. Uh, anybody that's been to the mouth of Squim Bay, um, you see that? No, you can't, it's behind this weird door. But basically it's got a spit enclosed. So, so I could imagine larva actually just recirculating in Squim Bay over and over again and then resettling. So um, just to kind of give a, a wrap up. Um, so here's a South Squim Bay uh, summary. Um, our catch per unit effort, if you look at 2017 was 0.26. The catch per unit effort in 2019 was 0.21. Although we caught two crabs, one of them was a, was a hand capture. Um, and so, um, which is pretty rare to find one and just pick it up. Um, and then 20, and you see zero catch per unit effort, um, even though there's effort. And then in 2021, um, you know, we caught the 16 and the catch per unit effort was 2.1 in 2018 or 2022, the effort was kind of back or the uh, catch per unit effort was um, very similar to what it was in 2017 and 2019. So that makes me feel Good. I mean, I, catch per unit efforts are really interesting metric in that it's sort of a relative measure 
Um, some of the catch per unit efforts like in Lummi Sea Pond are 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. So you're catching five crab every time you put out a trap. So you'd catch 500 crab in 100 traps. Um, uh, I just also want to mention that we, along with Fish and Wildlife, have trapped at Washington Harbor and Travis Spit on the northern end of Squim Bay. Um, and we haven't caught any crab in those marshes. So after several hundred traps. So really nice habitat, crab habitat, as some people refer to it. Here's a trap here at Washington Harbor. It's one of my favorite spots to go. There's a private duck club out there that's always very generous with us that lets us, us go out there. Um, so uh, update on Dungeness National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's here, you guys know, well, you're from here, so you know where Dungeness Spit is. Um, these slides are from Lawrence uh, Solomon at, at the refuge. Um, most crab over the last several years have been found at Graveyard Spit Channel. So this is, this is the, the um, headquarters here. So when you walk down onto the spit, it's down here at the base. And this is called the Base Lagoon. They caught a crab here for the first time in uh, two years, this last year. And they caught a total of 14 crab this year, um, which is actually up over previous years, which makes me a little bit concerned. But I believe that the, the refuge is really an example of hitting a new population. So in 2017, they went out and did a monthly monitoring with the Sea Grant. They have a Sea Grant uh, site out there, out in Graveyard Spit Channel. And they caught a couple of green crab the first time they went out. And they started trapping it really, really hard. I mean, when you think about this is heroic amounts of trapping, especially because they've got to drive three or four miles out on the spit in an ATV to get to their trap location. Um, you know, so 3,700 traps, almost 96 green crab, CPUE of, of 2.5. And you notice the CPUE stands, you know, kind of stays constant and then really plummets. And that's because they probably weren't catching some of the small ones. But if you keep catching the adults, um, they clearly trapped out this some of this population um this is a little concerning to me i um but still um you know i think about what would have happened considering you know you get 150 crabs together uh spawning a lot producing larva in this population if, if this had been go going on for several years you would end up with probably a situation not unlike that at macaw where where they really get momentum and they're kind of in every nook and cranny and you you know it's far harder to trap out 30,000 crab than 100 crab so um and do we get them all no not very likely but if you can get 90 percent of them i think that's a real win um, um just some take take homes that that lawrence gave me um they've had a, a intern in previous years, but not this last year. Um, and really, this is one staff member working with volunteers at the refuge. So if you live out that way and you want to tromp around in a marsh and spend a lot of time on Dungeness Spit, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a really good place to volunteer. Um, and then they also do some of the Washington Sea Grant uh, monthly monitorings, which really will capture any salt marsh changes that we might see over time if green crab do, do get established. Um, so they went through April through September which is a normal season. Um, uh, East Lagoon, which I didn't mention, is out here that's actually got a lot of suitable habitat in it. There's no green crab out there, thankfully. Um, and um, no young of the year caught, and then uh, one caught in that base lagoon after not catching any there for a few years. So Dungeness Spit is, I, I, I sort of led with Discovery Bay because I wanted to talk about Squim Bay and, and uh, Dungeness. Um, these are these are pretty good stories, actually. Um, so, on to the future. Um, so, are we going to keep? You know, are we? You know, are we going to be able to eliminate all the green crab in Washington State? Probably not. Um, can we keep them functionally irrelevant and important habitats? I think we might be able to. I really want to keep, I mean, my, you know, when I look at my goal as sort of an ecologist, and this is my first time fighting an invasive species, I'm like, if we can keep them basically irrelevant, that's a good thing. Um, I guess ecologically insignificant. It's a paper by uh, Ted Groschultz. I got to meet at a conference a couple of weeks ago. He's a really great guy. And Stephanie Green, 
And um, they, they talk about this idea of European green crab, getting them down to a level where they're not causing a lot of ecological harm. So when I think about this going into the future, it might mean that I'm out in these salt marsh channels in, uh, in Discovery Bay or in Jimmy Come Lately Creek with shrimp traps, which are very effective uh, green crab catching traps. And we're just running a trap line and maybe they've, they're established and we're like, we're never gonna get them all out, but we're gonna have their numbers low enough that not all the, the salt marsh banks are gonna erode and they're not gonna eat all the, the native hairy shore crab. Um, right now, I think about this as an invasion front. And if we can keep them out of some of these marshes from getting established, uh, you know, and that's where I feel like we're at with Discovery Bay, we still actually probably have an opportunity to make their life too hard for them to get really established in Discovery Bay. Um, so uh, really interesting paper, um, uh, Abigail Keller et al, um, sort of tracking an invasion front using eDNA. So, so Abby came out to Jimmy Come Lately Creek and we, or she took uh, eDNA samples. So, so just like bottles of water and then filtered them and did uh, DNA amplification on green crab DNA on a couple of, of strands of DNA that would normally be in, in green crab and was able to, this is interesting because this was in 2020, the samples from Jimmy Come Lately, I think she took five bottles and two of them showed green crab DNA. We didn't catch any green crab that year, but we did the next year. So it's possible that she actually got DNA, she likely did, from those baby crab or even like just slightly post larval set green crab that were in that marsh. Um, so there's some tools that, that are being developed that may be really useful. Interestingly enough, she also captured EDN, uh, green crab eDNA um, on Bashan Island, which is way further south than they've ever been found before. And they did a response trapping, didn't find any. So um, was that a larva that happened to be nearby. Um, there's also some thoughts. It's actually another, another possibility for a study is, um, is I'm involved with the Dungeness uh, Larval Light Trap Network through Pacific Northwest Crab Research Group is that you might be able to use water out of those light traps. Are you guys familiar with light traps? It's basically a water bottle with a light on it that, that turns on at night and funnels and crab larvae, we're looking at Dungeness crab larvae are photodactic. So they go in and then they go through the funnel and then they can't check out. So it's like a roach hotel. And, um, and so the idea is you're concentrating all these small crustaceans. Green crab are really difficult to, to their megalope. People are like, oh, you can just look at their megalope. They're really small. I know that sounds, I mean, Dungeness are, are actually, you know, they're, you know, half a, a, a centimeter. So you can kind of identify them really well, but some of these smaller crabs are really difficult to, to identify. And so, but if we could be taking maybe some eDNA samples out of those light traps, that could be really interesting because there's light traps down in South Sound as well. Um, so it's some kind of interesting studies um, going on. Um, and I think Fish and Wildlife is really looking at it going, they probably are never gonna have the staff to trap everything. So they are looking at some of the programs out in the outer coast estuaries where really the idea might be reducing numbers rather than elimination because you're talking about, again, probably hundreds of thousands of crab. But some of these shellfish farmers um, are actually getting um, sort of certified to trap green crab. Um, so, so there may be some local management. It may be an MR, uh, Marine Resources Committee thing in this area. Um, but um, the future continued. Um, so targeted removal, shellfish growers, tribes, local volunteers, I think is in the future. Um, recreational fishery, I get asked about this, like, why don't we just fish them out? And, and part of the reason why is that this invasion front where it's really important to trap them really hard, you're not gonna trap very many of them. You know, I've been out there for five years and I think I've caught fewer than a hundred crab and I've seen them twice. In, in out in the, in, in on, the, on the tide flats. So um, they're pretty rare in the locations that you want to eliminate them from. Um, there is a, a commercial and recreational fishery in Maine where, um, so uh, 
that brings us to this horrific photo. Um, this is at the Long Beach, California fish market. There are no, these are live green crabs, wild USA, $5.99 a pound, probably kind of way too much money for a species that you can't like eat like a dungeon ass. I mean, you pretty much need to make stock out of these or be super patient. Like if you've shucked a blue crab, imagine it being like, you know, 75% of that size or even a little bit smaller. And then like, that's not, and then think about, you know, coming from the land of Dungeness crab and yet yeah, exercise and frustration. Um, so, but what's interesting is, so California, even though you had the invasion in 1989, there are no green crab in Southern California. Totally, I mean, ecologically it can support green crab, but the way the currents work and the way there's really not any suitable habitat between about Elkhorn Slough, which is near Monterey, and somewhere south of Point Conception uh, is, uh, so in other words, I'm glad to hear that this fish market was not on the shoreline. Um, and then, so, uh, so I was at a conference and Bruno, um, it's the photo credit from Bruno Pernet, who's at, at uh, Cal State University, Long Beach. And we kind of were talking about green crab. Um, we were actually talking about Olympia oysters, but there are a whole bunch of folks that knew a lot about green crab. And uh, they called California Fish and, Department of Fish and Wildlife and said, hey, these are like, it's a bucket of live green crab in a part of California where green crab don't occur and we don't want them to invade Southern California. And California Department of Fish and Wildlife said, they are classified as a shellfish species. We have a bag limit on them and there was nothing they could do. And I was like, oh, so when people say, well, we should just fish them out, we'd have to reclassify them from a class one prohibited species to a, basically a shellfish species or game species, I mean, not a game species, but, but a fish species that you can possess. So right now, so like all those Washington Sea Grant volunteers, um, I'm a bit of an exception because I work for a tribe, but shellfish growers that are trapping green crab, all have been trained to identify them. And they also have an aquatic invasive species permit in order to possess them after they catch them. Um, the other issue with let's just trap them out is, uh, is that in the early 2000s, that's what Fish and Wildlife said. If you catch a green crab, stick it in a baggie and freeze it and then like submit it. This is like kind of before smartphones were a thing and you can take a picture. And they found, they basically had a freezer full of dead kelp crabs and other green native crabs, right? I mean, it's a terrible, I mean, we should call them like European shore crabs or something because we have a lot of native green crabs. And so um, that's the other cautionary tale. Like we don't wanna be um, capturing them. So, um, so that's, you know, I see targeted, targeted captures. Um, I think, you know, talking about my organization, Jamestown Spawn Tribe and Fish and Wildlife will definitely focus on Discovery Bay and um, may also, I mean, there's a big focus on Seabeck as well and, that, and some of the estuaries in Hood Canal that actually haven't been trapped yet. Um, the emergency declaration, I think what it's really brought to the table is funding for technicians. This is labor intensive work, um, some methods developing like eDNA. Uh, in organizations. So in other words, they really kind of, it was a bit ad hoc until last year. And then it was like, how do we organize a statewide response? Regions, sub-regions, et cetera. It's probably a whole nother lecture that I'm not qualified to give. But um, so it's been a very good thing in terms of trying to battle these. Um, so where to report a sighting? Oh, we have, have, you, have we passed around the green crab yet? Okay, good. Um, so there is a phone number here. I mean, really probably just Google uh, aquatic invasive species, fish and wildlife, and um, you will get to, to where you need to go. You can email crab team at uw.edu um, and then online um, report um, a sighting. They are asking that if you think you have found a live green crab to take a picture of it and send it to them with a location. And um, that's probably prudent to be telling the public that based on their experiences in the early 2000s. However, I think, so I've been out 
hundreds of days in the last five years, maybe not hundreds, but a lot. I've spent a lot of time in salt marshes and I have seen green crab alive exactly twice in the natural environment. One time it was moving so fast uh, and it paused and I identified it. And then it kept moving very fast and I couldn't catch it. And the second time I caught it with a dip net. And so the chances of actually finding a live crab are pretty low, but what you might find, and a lot of folks here spend a lot of time on the beach or in salt marshes are molt. And this is, pay attention to the shape of molt because then you can pick it up, you can look at it, you can record its, its location. Um, I don't think it's illegal to bring a molt off the beach. Regardless, you can take a picture of it and send it in to, to, uh, to crab team. Um, molts are really, I've found molts several times and it's usually led to finding, it's always led to finding green crab nearby. Um, so that's my advice for you is to find, uh, is to look for molts.